Protectors of the Suna Suna Protectors of the Suna Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasul Allah. Uh, welcome to another session of our series entitled Vida in Islam or Innovation in Islam. And when we talk about innovations in Islam, we're speaking about introducing something new or taking away from the way we worship Allah. Does everyone understand that? Innovation in Islam entails introducing something new into the way we worship Allah or taking away from how Allah legislated through our prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how he is to be worshipped. The Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that before the last hour comes, Islam will become strange, meaning that you will find many, many people claiming to be Muslim. But the reality is most of them will be just Muslim in name, not in practice. Most of these Muslims will not even understand what la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah means. Most of these Muslims will innovate. They will have introduced practices, procedures into this way of life that was not sanctioned by Allah. They will have changed the laws of Allah, adding things, add, making things lawful that Allah made haram and making things haram that Allah made lawful. And unfortunately, we're, we are seeing a lot of that today. So this is why we have to be so careful as Muslims uh, to make sure Number one, that we do understand our religion correctly. And that's why the foundation of Islam is based on Tawheed, Aqidah, your belief system. If your belief system is not correct, then nothing else about you is correct. If your belief system is not correct, your prayers will not be done correctly. Your fasting, your good deeds, how you live and interact with others. Nothing will be done correctly if your belief system is not as it should be. And that's why <clears throat> as a diet, I focus on Akida, 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 your belief system, and then the Sunnah, the Sunnah, the Sunnah, the Hadiths, the things the Prophet Muhammad said and the things the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, okay? So we've been speaking about the different innovations in Islam. And today what I'm gonna do is speak about, again, Tawheed. And I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail about one of the biggest innovative groups here in America which is known as the Jumat Tabli, okay? And all of this is taken from the book, is based on the book written by Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli. And let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen for tonight. <clears throat> and this is session 13 of our series, 
We're going to speak about, first of all, politics, innovations in regards to politics. I remember every time there's an election here in America, I was born and raised in America. I've been sitting on this internet since 1986 uh, teaching what I'm teaching now, the basics of Islam. Every time there's a presidential election, I have been telling Muslims, what are you voting for? We don't vote in elections. The prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a Kafir, a non-Muslim can never be a guardian over a Muslim. So I've always told Muslims here in America, what are you participating in presidential elections for? These are all, they're all the same. They're all Kafirs, which means their lifestyle is not like ours. They have no sympathy, no empathy for us or you, okay? They believe in things that we don't believe in. First of all, democracy. We don't believe in a democracy, guys. I keep telling you Muslims that there's no democracy in Islam. We believe in a caliphate, okay? We don't believe in a democracy. And I've discouraged Muslims from voting, but they still vote. The biggest turnout was during Obama's term. We had famous Muslim personalities here in America doing lectures, telling everyone to get out and vote. Vote for Obama because he was a black man, I guess. I don't know. But like I told you guys then, whether he's black, white, crippled, maimed, deaf, dumb, mute, he still doesn't believe Muhammad Rasulullah, and he's going to be totally, that means what he stands for, his lifestyle is going to be in contradiction to ours. People didn't listen. A lot of famous personalities were seen on TV, shaking hands, eating Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas dinner too, with the Obamas. The Muslims turned it out, turned the voting polls out and supported and voted for Obama. Well, I hope you Muslims have a good explanation as to why you legalized homosexuality because this is why we do not vote for Kafirs. We don't participate in non-Muslim <clears throat> elections because they don't stand or believe in what we do. Same-sex marriage, you guys helped put that on the table, okay? All these laws passed that, get, that contradict, you know, what the laws of Sharia are. You all are held accountable for that, okay? So when it comes to politics, even in politics, we have to abide by the rules and the guidelines that are law set forth. And the number one rule is a non-Muslim could never be a guardian over a Muslim. So we do not support them. We do not as far as voting for them. We don't participate in non-Islamic elections because they're not going to be to our benefit. Okay? And there are other innovations too. A lot other uh, innovations as well that Muslims engage in. And we're going to go over uh, some of those common mistakes and common innovations in regards to politics. First of all, separating our lives between church and state as if there are some aspects of our lives that have not been legislated by a law. 
you know, you will hear a lot of famous Muslim speakers here, uh, the same ones that you see sitting in the White House with the presidents, okay? Not understanding that those presidents are using them to get the Muslim vote so they could get in office. You will hear these people say that there's a, a separation between the uh, religion and state. We have to understand that everything that we do as Muslims centers around a law. Remember, a law tells us in the Quran, say indeed my prayer, my sacrifice, my life and my death are all for a law. So there is no separation between the two. You cannot say that I'm a Muslim, but I'm running for uh, a president to be a, a, a political seat, you know, because there's a separation between my religion and politics, my religion and the state. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. Everything we do is for supposed to be for Allah, guys. Okay. Also, another uh, uh, common innovation. Like I said, guys, we don't believe in a democracy. Islam, our way of life is not founded on a democracy. If it were, then the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have never been a prophet. If we ran everything based on majority vote, what's what the people want, we would never have had Prophet Muhammad as a messenger of Allah, and we would have never become the Muslims that we are, okay? Islam is ran by an imam, one imam, one leader. That leader is the leader over all other Muslims. He makes the decisions. He makes the rules. He makes the guidelines based on the book of Allah and based on the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Does everybody understand that? There is no democracy. I cannot come into this website and say, let's take a vote as to whether or not the women should wear hijab. How many of you are for women wearing hijab? How many of you are against women wearing hijab? And then the majority rules, that's not Islam, no. Whether you like it or not, Allah's laws are his laws. Does everybody understand that? The majority, does not constitute what is right. The majority does not constitute what is the truth. If you look at most Muslim countries, you will find that the majority don't practice Islam. Does that mean that Islam is dead? Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning most of the people will not believe no matter how much you try to make them or how much you want them, guys. The majority of the people will never believe in a law. The majority of the people will never accept a law's laws. The majority of the people will never accept a law's rules. The majority of the people will never accept the sunnah. That's why the majority of the people will end up in hell. So this majority rule, that's not Islam. Democracy is not Islam. So for those of you Muslims that advocate that, you advocate democracy, you advocate the majority rule, you are advocating against Islam. Also, Abandoning the laws of Allah and instead replacing them 
with others' opinions or what others think is best, okay? If the people have views that contradict what Allah says, then their views don't count. Does everyone understand that? And this is what I was speaking about before class, okay? If there's a problem in your community with the leadership of your community, say for example, the Islamic center and your community is not abiding, the Imam is not doing something that he's supposed to do, then it's upon the leaders to consult with the trusted and knowledgeable scholars. Okay? It's the job of the people of knowledge. It's the job of the scholars to try to keep everyone balanced, to try to keep everyone upon the laws of a law. Okay? <clears throat> so when we consult as Muslims, when we seek advice as to how to handle ourselves, Politically, we're supposed to seek that advice from the people of knowledge, not from the people in your community. Just because I got a group of brothers over there who have an opinion as to how things should be run and another group over there, I don't consult with them. We consult with the people of knowledge. We bring in the scholars. We bring in the people of knowledge who can help us to stay within the guidelines and the guidance of Allah and his prophet. That's how it's done. Does everybody understand that? Okay. The governing does not revolve around what you like or what you believe. Governing evolves around what Allah likes and what Allah, Allah said is to be. Also another innovation regarding politics, dividing the Muslim nation into large parties. For example, individual countries and cities being ruled by different individuals. This is what we were talking about earlier. Instead of there being one mosque, for example, now we got 10 mosques because you think that the mosque is on is not on the right minhaj. You don't even know what minhaj means, okay? All you're doing is causing more problems. You're dividing us even more, okay? Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, this community of yours is one single community since I am the sustainer of you all remain conscious of me. One masjid, one community, one God, one nation, not 10 communities, not 10 masjids, okay? If you were on the correct menhaj, you would know that and you wouldn't be dividing. We're supposed to be one, one community, okay? And if there's a problem, bring in the true people of knowledge to resolve our disputes. Not appointing yourself as a person to resolve anything. Everybody understand that, okay? More innovations regarding politics, having kings and presidents instead of having one ruler. This is what you see happening in many of the Muslim lands, presidents, kings. You know, we're supposed to have one ruler over us, but just to let you guys know, that doesn't mean that it's your job or my job to go around trying to establish an Islamic state. That ain't gonna happen. The innovation has already occurred. We're already divided, you know. We will have 
one leader. And that won't happen until the Mahdi comes. The Mahdi, when he comes back, he will be the one leader for the rest of us. But the innovation already occurred. The deviation away from that one Islamic state already occurred. Nothing we can do about it now except wait for the Mahdi. But what you can do individually is stop dividing the communities within your area. For example, Muslims living in America, stop dividing, you know, the Muslims in your city more by making all these different masjids. You can stop that, okay? There should be one masjid per city, per town, okay? And we all go there, okay? You can control that. Nothing you can do about a caliph. That ain't going to happen until the Mahdi. But within your individual areas of living and here in America, you know, we can try to be one strong Ummah. Okay. And let me give us an example. I live in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland consists of over 50 or more suburbs big city. So there's not just one masjid. It would be kind of virtually impossible because let me use my example where I live and where my brother Issa lives. We are, there's a two hour difference. It would take me an hour and 45 minutes to get to my brother Issa's house. That's how long, because I'm in one suburb, He's which is one city. He's in another within this one big color gun city. So there's a masjid where he lives. There's an Islamic center where he lives. There's an Islamic center where I live. So this is not causing division. This is not causing separation, okay? Then where Latifa lives, Latifa lives an hour from me, okay? My cousin Mukhtar, he lives an hour from me. My mother, is an hour from me, okay? They have a masjid for them too. In fact, there's two masjids, okay? Two masjids, you know, where they are, but you know, they're not contradicting each other, but they're put in, they're strategically placed to make it easier for the Muslims to get, you know, to come together, to congregate. So something like that is fine. But what we're seeing is, and say where I live, there's five masjids in walking distance. I can walk out the door, go to one mosque here, another mosque down the street, another. No, this is what this is not as this is not how it's supposed to be. That's division. That's separation. Does everybody get it? Okay. What's the point in you making another mosque in this small town or this city? All you're doing is separating us, dividing us. This is an innovation. This is a bit of, this is not what Islam is about. If you got a problem with that mosque, call in the people of knowledge to come and counsel and advise, but you don't break off. Everybody get that? Okay. so. We can't control the fact that there's kings and presidents of different countries and all of that, okay? For example, the king of Saudi Arabia, the prince of Dubai, all that stuff. We have, that's already been done. That innovation is there. We'll deal with that when the mock deed comes and when Jesus comes. But what we can do is for those of us who live in a country such as America, that is not an Islamic state. What we can do is try to, you know, unite together, you know, and make our communities one, as the law says it should be. Does everybody understand that? And stop all this division. Also, taking arms against the rulers. Now, this applies to those Muslim countries, such as Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Kuwait, whatever, Syria. 
the innovation already occurred. These countries have kings and all of that. Nothing you can do. It ain't going to go away until the mock deep comes. If your ruler is ruling and you think that your ruler is unjust, you are not supposed to pick up arms and go out and try to kill them, which is what we see happening today. Again, there is a format that a law put into place for us as to how to handle disputes politically. You know, you call in the people of knowledge, you call in the learned men, and the learned men will sit down with our leaders and advise them, remind them, correct them. We don't take it upon ourselves to pick up arms and go around killing one another, killing our leaders, okay? There's a hadith where the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that one of the signs of the last hour will be that your rulers will be oppressive over you. They will make laws that go against my sunnah. They will even make laws that go, goes against the law's laws. But do not, do not pick up arms and fight against them. As long as these men are performing the prayers, you do not pick up arms and fight against them. Instead, you try to remind them and advise them. And how do we do that? By calling in the people of knowledge, okay? But rebelling against our rulers, this is not from the Quran and Sunnah. And then for those of us living in a non-Muslim country, such as America, the same thing. If you're unhappy with the Imam of the Masjid, by the way, the Imam of the Masjid you know, he's not supposed to be ruled, overruled by an executive board. The imam of the mosque, it's his job to be your spiritual leader, your spiritual advisor. He's, it's his job to handle any disputes that his people may have, okay? If you think your imam is not doing his job, you don't pick up arms against him again we call in the people of knowledge and have the people of knowledge sit and talk with him. But you do not, you know, uh, pick up arms against him. Okay? Does everybody understand that? Also, another innovation, making elections and special terms for the head of each country Nothing we can do about that because we don't live in those countries. Also ruling and judging by other than the Quran and the authentic Hadiths. <clears throat> this is for the Muslim countries too. Our laws and our rules should be based on what Allah said and what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said not based on what's popular to the people. For those of us living in America, this is not an Islamic state. This is not an Islamic country. You know, we cannot enforce our laws in this country, okay? Anyone that thinks they can is ignorant, okay? If you want Sharia law, get up, go to Saudi Arabia. And even Saudi doesn't have Sharia law as it should be, okay? But what we can do as imam of your community is make sure you know that you know you you are leading the people in accordance to the laws and rules given by Allah and His Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and that any disputes that your people have amongst each other that you resolve them based on the rules and guidelines of the Quran and the Sunnah, okay? So I hope that's clear. It's not our job to go around trying to establish an Islamic state. You're ignorant, okay? 
that will be established by a law when the Mahdi comes. And I'm teaching that in my other class, but we talk about that in the resurrection. But what it is your job to do, living in a non-Muslim country is to number one, abide by the laws of that country. And then number two, to abide by the rules and guidelines set by Allah and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in regards to how to get along with others. Does everybody understand that? And to not transgress that. So those are some of the common innovations that we see regarding politics. And so now what I wanna speak about are common innovations that we see in regards to calling others to a law. People who call themselves dia, okay? When it comes to calling people to a law, there are some people who say, before we call non-Muslims, we need to clean our house first. And we're going to talk about these people in a minute. There's a group or a set of Muslims that do not believe in giving dawah to non-Muslims at all. They say that our dawah should only focus on the Muslims because we have to clean our house first. This is not correct. As Muslims, it's our job to give dawah to anyone that we come in contact with. Okay. Also, another innovation. There are some Muslims that also believe that when it comes to calling the non Muslims to Islam, that we don't have to talk about Islam at all to them. We can show them this is true, but they will say, don't talk at all about Islam to them. How many of you have come upon? different sets that say that. We're gonna talk about them. This is a Jamaata bleak. We're gonna speak about them in a minute. They say that uh, you should not speak about Islam at all to non-Muslims. Don't tell them nothing. If they ask questions, don't even answer. Just show them. That's not Islam. This is an innovation. If a person asks, we will answer. We don't go around forcing our way of life on people. But if people ask and we are in a position to answer, we'll answer them, okay? Also, another innovation is calling non-Muslims to Islam by talking to them about other issues instead of Tawheed. And this is something that you find me constantly reminding you guys of. If a person is interested in Islam, we don't talk to them about polygamy. Why would I tell a woman who is interested in converting to Islam about polygamy? If a person is interested in converting to Islam, we talk to them about Allah. I'm gonna tell her about Allah's names, Allah's attributes, how Allah is most forgiving, how Allah sees and knows all things, how Allah loves those of us who turn to him and re out of, in repentance, okay? So the way to invite non-Muslims is by first telling them about Allah, teaching them what it means to believe in him, what it means to have allegiance to him. Why is it? that most Muslims today have no allegiance to Allah, no allegiance to the Prophet Muhammad, no allegiance to other Muslims. It's because they themselves were not taught properly, okay? <clears throat> so when we invite others to Islam, we begin by teaching them Tawheed, and that's based on that Hadith, whereas when the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Mu'ad as the first messenger to the people of Yemen. He told them, teach them about Allah first. 
and only when they understand that, then teach them the prayer and stuff. Okay? So if you're inviting a non-Muslim to Islam or calling them to our way of life, you educate them about Allah first and then the, the, the prayer and we follow that format. Also, more innovations. There's a lot of Muslims out there who call themselves giving dawah but they accept approaches designed by non-Muslims instead of accepting the approaches designed by the prophet. For example, this interfaith crap, this interfaith, which is basically calling to the appreciation and the acceptance of all ways of life. I tell you guys all the time, interfaith goes against Islamic principles. As Muslims, we don't believe in interfaith. We know that there is no interfaith. There is no appreciation. There is no acceptance of all ways of life. Allah tells us that in the Quran, that he, the only way of life that he accepts is submission to him. Allah tells us in the Quran, any other way of life will be rejected. So all these interfaith uh, uh, approaches designed by non-Muslims, they contradict Islam. And as a Muslim, we're not supposed to be engaging in that. But unfortunately, ever since 9-11, this is what Muslims are doing. This is what they're doing. Also, a big innovation that we see, that I see even with the Muslim youth, using the Bible that interfaith dialogue has led to people, Muslims using the Bible instead of the Quran. We've already talked about how Allah says that the Bible doesn't even exist anymore. We talked about how Allah says he replaced the Bible with the Quran, okay? So why are Muslims uh, uh, reading that book anyway? Okay, and it really makes me sad to see Muslim youth, you know, a young Muslim boy, a young Muslim girl can't even come to an Islamic event and speak about Islam, you know, without referring to the Bible. You know, the Kafir are giving dawah to us and calling us and pulling us to their belief system. If I ask you about Moses, Instead of that child telling me what Allah says about Moses, they're telling me what some Bible says about Moses. This is the, the dangers. This is the, what happens when we deviate away from the Sunnah and we take on these approaches designed by non-Muslims, okay? Our Muslim youth utilizing the Bible and they know nothing of the Quran and the Hadith. Also, another innovation, certain groups adopting certain titles and labels causing division amongst the Muslims. We have to remember Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, he is the one that named you Muslim. Why are you calling yourself Salafi? Let's just get real. Did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say he's Salafi? Did Abu Bakr say he was Salafi? Did Umar Aisha say they were Salafi? Okay. We are Muslim. This name was given to us by Allah. Muslim means one who submits to Allah. And just so you guys know, Salafi is not even a, a noun. Salafi is an action. It means that I am living my life 
following the example of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his examples, I mean, and his companions. And my ideology is based on the understanding of those companions. So Salafi, the Arabic term is not even a noun. It, it's a, a, an action verb. If you are Salafi, you don't have to call yourself that. You should be able, a person should, tell, should be able to recognize that you are Salafi just by listening to you for five minutes. I can listen to a person talk for five minutes and tell if that person's upon the Salafia Dawa or not. Okay? We don't have to use those type of labels. We don't have to use those type of terms. We're all Muslims. Allah gave us the best name, Muslim. So these labels and terms like Salafi, like uh, Shiite, Sufi, you know, this is not from the Sunnah. This is innovation, guys. Okay? We're not supposed to give ourselves certain titles and labels because all this does is cause division anyway. People ask me, Sister Layla, what are you? I'm a Muslim. That's it. A simple Muslim. The same Muslim, inshallah, that the Prophet Muhammad was. The same Muslim that those companions were. That's it. I'm just a Muslim. Don't label me. Don't put me in no set. Don't put me in no group other than the group of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions, okay? So this is a big innovation. We have to stop all this Salafi stuff, okay? If you Salafi, prove it. Prove that you Salafi through your actions. Don't sit there and use that term. Prove it, okay? Also, another innovation, uh, Hold on for a second. Um, hold on for a second. How do I, uh, wait a minute, let me do this. Okay, so this is an innovation. So now what I want to do, guys, is go into another uh, such group. Uh, one of the most popular groups here in America. Uh, many of my students here in my Zoom room, husbands, or affiliates, you know, belong to this group. Uh, Sheikh Atley speaks about it in, in detail, well, in summarized detail in his book, The Jama'at El Takbli. The Jama'at El Takbli. Let's talk about this group. This is a group of Muslims. Excuse me for one second. Excuse me. Don't close my door. Okay. I can't breathe. You know, um, this is a group of Muslims who follow their own philosophy when it comes to giving dawah. And their philosophy is that giving dawah should only be to the Muslim. They don't focus on giving dawah to anyone other than the Muslims. Okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. They believe that they have to clean their own houses first. What this means is that they believe in their philosophy that Muslims 
should perfect their worship and character before calling to non-Muslims. And this is never going to happen, as you guys know. As Muslims, we will always have shortcomings. No one is perfect. We will always commit sins. But even still, we have to follow the methodology of the Prophet Muhammad. And the Prophet Muhammad did not tell us to only focus on ourselves. The Dawah of Islam is for everyone. The Dawah of Islam is for everyone. We have to advise, remind the non-Muslims as well as ourselves, guys. So, but this is the philosophy of the Jamaat al tabliq You know, they follow their own philosophy of giving Dawah and they concentrate on Muslims only. And the way that they call to Islam, it, it contradicts the Sunnah of the Prophet too. Their method of calling the people does not change. They always give the same lectures. They use the same books. They follow the same procedures. Some of these famous speakers here in America that you guys listen to, you can tell that they come from this set because all their lectures are the same. They give the same lectures. They use the same book. They never deviate away from it. You invite them to your mosque. You invite them to that mosque. Every conference is the same lecture over and over and over and over again, okay? You listen to their videos, same lecture, same topic over and over and over again. Now, this movement was founded by a man named Muhammad Ilyas and his son Yusuf. And after them, a man named El Hassan. And over the years and under the different leaderships, their program has never changed. The Jamaat al Tabli, their program is based on six points. And these six points imitate the five pillars that the Prophet Muhammad said that Islam is based upon. But those six points exclude many important aspects. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. Allah says, indeed, my prayer my sacrifice, my life and death are for Allah, okay? We can't go around excluding what Allah tells us not to exclude. For the Jamaat al tagbli you know, there's six points, and I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail showing how their six points exclude important things. We have to understand as Muslims that all aspects of our lives is included in Islam. Islam is not just a religion, it's a way of life. The prophet taught us how to live, how to eat, how to sleep, how to walk, how to pray, how to bathe, how to communicate, how to get along with our neighbors, how to get along with each other, okay? It's not just six points, okay? And our worship, it's not just limited to prayer and vicar. This is important. A lot of Muslims think that when we talk about worship, we're only speaking about praying and remembering Allah. No, you can turn any action, any mundane action can be turned into an act of worship if it's done for the sake of Allah. And if it's done, you know, the way Allah legislated. But the Tabli people, they don't believe in this, okay? So now I'm gonna show you how their six point program deviates from the Sunnah. And if we can start with their Kalima Shahada. Now as Muslims, our Shahada is La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Dora Rasulullah. That's our shahada. 
but what they teach is something different, okay? What they teach is something different. What they teach does not go beyond a law being lowered, okay? As Muslims, we know, and we've talked about in my other classes, how even uh, the Arabs before the prophet Muhammad became a prophet, the Quraysh believed in Allah. They believed in his existence. They just did not believe that he was the only one worthy of worship. That's what made them Kafir. But if you were to ask the Quraysh, does Allah exist? They would have said, yeah. They referred to Allah as the one who created the Kaaba, the creator of the universe. But they just didn't believe that he was the only one uh, worthy of worship. Well, the Juma Tablik, you know, they don't go beyond that. You know, they don't teach, they don't teach beyond that. They don't mention Allah's names and attributes. They don't talk about how Allah has hands, how Allah can see. They don't teach that Allah is ab uh, above his throne. They don't teach this. They also don't teach the lordship of Allah. They don't teach any of this. So this is how their shahada differs. And also, even when it comes to knowledge and remembrance, they differ than us. What they do is whenever any knowledge is given, they cite their source as their leaders, the elders, instead of basing their knowledge on what Allah and the prophet said, they pass down what they've learned from their elders, okay? They also attract large numbers of followers because they neglect to teach anything that can be considered as controversial. They don't teach anything that has, that falls in a category of having a difference of opinion. They teach the people that if you want to know more to go to a scholar, to understand uh, the rulings of things. <clears throat> so as you, and they also use weak and fabricated hadith. They use a lot of hadith from Mishkat. Okay, Mishkat has some authentic uh, uh, hadiths in it, but a lot of their, the Mishkat is uh, fabricated. Okay, they use a lot of the weak, fabricated hadiths of Dawood and, and Ibn Majah. So we have to be careful dealing with these people because they don't base their stuff on authenticity. Okay. Also, they focus on remembering Allah. Uh, and they, but they do it in a way that contradicts how the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us. The prophet taught us that there's different, many different ways that we can say and remember Allah, okay? One day a Jewish man came to a companion, Salman al-Farsi, and said, your prophet taught y'all everything, even how to use the bathroom. And Salman al-Farsi said, yes, he taught us, for example, when using the bathroom to not face the direction of the Qibla and to use our left hand and to cleanse ourselves with water, to not use bones, to not use dung. And by following those guidance that the prophet gave us, we have turned in the act of answering the call of nature and to an action of remembrance of Allah. SubhanAllah. So Salman al-Farsi, <clears throat> he made that Jew look stupid and foolish. Okay, well, the Jamaat Hadli, 
they do the same thing. They only use certain actions as means of uh, 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 remembering a lot. They teach the people that breathing a certain way during remembering a law will bring them closer to him. And a lot of their uh, of this comes from their Sufi teachings, okay? That if you breathe in and breathe out a certain way, you know, you're gonna get closer. Just like the Sufis believe uh, twirling in a circle until you get drunk uh, brings you closer. Okay. Also, these people, they invite to their houses to teach Islam. They also will go to a mosque and invite the Muslims to the mosque, but they do not accept the invitation of hospitality from anyone. Okay. This is another way in which they differ. And they'll use it for, they'll do this for a certain amount of days. They'll come to the mosque and stay for 30 days, for example, teaching you. And then they'll leave and go to another mosque, another 30 days or whatnot. You know, they'll uh, extend their time away from their family. This is not from the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did not go away from his family for extended periods to teach the deen, nor did he order the Muslims to stay in the mosques for extended visits, except for Itikaf. So again, this contradicts the Sunnah as well. They also do this thing called Jawla. And what is Jawla? This is the assigning of certain roles to people who participate and Kuruj, what they do is have a spokesperson for their group to communicate, okay? Uh, the Amir is another person who's in charge of the group. This is all against Islam. And also whenever they do come together in a group to dhikr or remember Allah, they gather in a circle and they make collective supplication before they leave. And everything that they do is, is, is through a formula. And again, every group follows the same procedure. Also, some of their leaders wear amulets to protect them from evil. And uh, you will find them with uh, Ayat Corsi uh, bracelets or I had coarsely necklaces on, you know, or I had coarsely hanging up in their car and stuff like this to protect them from evil. And all of this is shirk. All of this uh, contradicts uh, the Quran and the Sunnah. And again, they only use a few books. They use Riyadh Salahin. And I tell you guys all the time, Riyadh Salahin is not a source of hadith. It's, it's not a source. It's not like Bukhari and Muslim. It's not like Termiti. Okay, it's not like Muwata. All right. They use Riyadh Salahin, you know, as their book of choice. They also use uh, uh, many, many weak hadiths and teachings. And they don't have any scholars or learned people amongst their groups. They'll just, anybody that's willing to just join them, spend 30 days away from their family, teaching and talking about what's in those books and remembering a law in the group, you're welcome to join them. They don't have any real trained people of knowledge or any real scholars amongst them. So that's a summary of the Jumata talk bleep and what they believe. And as you can see, their belief goes totally against uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet and his companions. You know, you have to stay away from these groups, guys. There's only one type of Muslim 
And that's the Muslim that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was. We have to try to mold ourselves into being what he was, what his companions was, and stay away and stay clear away from these other groups. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop right here for today. And I know we covered a lot. I want you guys to understand, you know, the politics. Uh, I hear a lot of Muslims saying, oh, it's all about a democracy. Technically, there's no democracy in Islam. There's a caliphate, not a democracy. Participating in elections, presidential elections. No, we don't do that because no non-believer could ever be a guardian over us. Just like as a woman, you can't have a non-Muslim as a guardian over you. You know, we cannot have a non-Muslim as a ruler over any of us. Okay. Make sure that as we live in these Western countries, we are not allowing the Western ideology to overtake us and we become westernized in our thinking and our practice, okay? You have to be able to live here in the West, but still maintain your Muslim identity without transgressing the limits. And for many people, that's hard to do. It's easy for me, but it may be hard for others. All right. So we'll stop right here. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments, inshallah, you can type them. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa tubi ilaik. Questions or comments, go ahead.